Well, when we think about stories, it's, it's, you know, story is one of the most powerful tools we have in, in really the human existence. I, I think if I spent some time with uh, my family recently, and on my dad's side I, in particular, I remember every time you get together as a family, you get the extended family together, the stories just flow. And, and stories of childhood, stories about neighbors, stories about uh, other family members, and, and it doesn't matter like how many times we've gotten together and how many times we've heard those stories. They just, when you get, especially my dad and his brothers, it's just, the stories just keep coming. And the stories have gotten better through the years uh, as their recollection of things have changed. But uh, it's one of the most, to me, actually enjoyable things about sitting around with family is hearing those stories and and, and the power of story uh, that you have there. Um, Recently, marketing, in the last 15 years, marketing has really taken a turn, and now they, uh, one of the common themes, and those of you who are in advertising marketing know that telling the story is one of the most important things that you can do. And in fact, there's one who said, uh, stories don't, you don't want to tell people what to think anymore, but through story, you get people to ask the right questions. You get people to feel a certain way. And so story is this really kind of powerful thing. And uh, this morning, we are actually taking a turn in our study in the book of Luke and starting to look at a different angle of the book of Luke. And we're going to be looking through the stories that Jesus told. In fact, we're calling this section the storyteller, and it's lessons at the feet of Jesus. And, and so this is a section we call parables. And in the parables, they essentially are stories that Jesus told. I often picture it as Jesus kind of sitting around the campfire with his disciples. And I, I guess and sometimes we hear that it's in a, a large group that he was teaching. And, and, but he would sit and he would tell a story to communicate something and to get people to ask the right questions. And so this morning we're going to start this uh, section or this uh, series of parables that will take us through the rest of the summer and look at the stories that Jesus told. Now a couple things that we want to know about the parables and, and why Jesus used parables or why he used stories. It was very common in the ancient world as it is today. But these are different than fables. The parables were not, you know, in a fable you have like a talking fox and a chicken and all kinds of things, and they're just completely made up fantasy. But stories were usually some uh, likely or an event that could actually happen. They could be made up, but they were real life situations and circumstances, and it was a story about something. Now, in the parables, they were stories that were meant to reveal uh, truths or mysteries about God. But at the same time, they're meant to conceal those very same truths. The parable was not intended to be kind of a softball answer that said, here you go, now you know exactly what to think, exactly what to believe, exactly how to feel. They were intended for those who said, I want to know more and to go deeper. So they contained mysteries of God in them, but at the same time, they were concealing the mysteries for those who didn't want to seek out the truth. So the intentionality between the storytelling was to kind of separate out those who really wanted to go deeper and receive this truth. And we'll find that today. Jesus actually mentions that. So parables were meant to, to, for those to seek the deeper understanding. Um, and then also with parables, just so we can have this in mind, as always with Scripture, but we want to not hear them as people in 21st century San Diego County. You want to always try the best you can to, as one theologian said, to sit in the back of the crowd of the original audience and try to hear what they heard. Now this morning, the nice thing is, is the one that we'll hear is, it it does kind of translate very easily to our day, but you always want to hear it in the original context, and you want to ask the questions, what would that have sounded like to them? What did that feel like to them when they heard it? And then we can bring that forward into 21st century. So in parables, you always want to start with, what was that like? For them, how did they hear it? And and so that's just kind of the overview of parables as we get started. So I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 8. And as you find your way there, uh, allow me to pray. God, we thank you so much uh, that you give us uh, these descriptions about you and your words that we can learn about who you are and how you revealed yourself to mankind. And I pray now, Lord, that these words would be yours, um, not mine and that you would bring us into your presence. We know that you are present. Help us be aware. And I pray that you help transform and change us based on who you are and nothing that we do but what you've done. So we thank you and give you this time. Amen. 
So the book of Luke, chapter 8, if you are new to Scripture, uh, Luke is in what we call the New Testament, about two-thirds of the way through your Bible. Um, the Gospels are the stories about Jesus, and it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we're in the book of Luke, chapter 8. And uh, picking it up in verse 4, I'll read parts of this to, to you, and we'll walk through it. So chapter 8, verse 4, it starts this, The large crowd was coming together, and those from various cities were journeying to Jesus. And he spoke by way of parable. Jesus tells this story. Verse 5, the sower went out to sow his seed. So that's a, a farmer or so. Goes out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some of the seed fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and as the thorns grew up, it choked out, choked it out. In verse 8, as the other seed fell into the good soil, it grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. And as Jesus said these things, he would call out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant, he said, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Okay, let's just stop there for a moment. So Jesus starts off this, this in, in the book of Luke, the series of parables, and he starts off with this one. And he, he tells it, it's about a farmer who throws some seed on the ground, and in the ancient world, they actually would actually throw the seeds on the ground first, and then they would plow and till the seed into the soil. And so he tells the story of that happened. Now, some of the seed that stayed on the rocky soil, this would be the, the seed that they didn't plow into the ground. It grows up, or it never grows. It, it's snatched away and eaten by the birds. There's some seed that's on that soil that actually took root, it grows up, but then in time, it withers away. And, and dies. And then the other seed grows up. It's in the soil, but maybe not where they're actually cultivating. It grows up and it's doing well, but then the weeds and thorns also grow near it. So though it's growing, it cannot produce fruit. And then the fourth uh, part that he mentions here is there's some seed that's planted where it's meant to be planted. It grows, it's in the good soil, and it produces a crop a hundredfold. Another way of saying way more, multiple, multiple, over, from one seed, you get a lot of fruit. You get a lot of evidence of whatever this is. So that's the story he tells to them. And then right after that, he says, he who has ears, let him hear. Now, that's a bizarre statement to us. You would think like, okay, I have ears, so I heard you. But really what he's referring to is this is a, a quote from the prophets, in particular in Isaiah, where Isaiah says, though they have ears, they do not hear. Though they can see, they don't perceive. And it, it's actually a prophecy talking about people who've closed out their hearts to God. And so their hearts have become hard. And though they hear and though they see, they can't perceive or it's never, it never takes root. So what Jesus does, he gives them a parable and he says, may you have ears to hear. May you be people who receive this message. May you not be the opposite of that, which he then goes on to say, of, of people who though are seeing never perceive or hearing never actually grasp this truth. So Jesus tells them that and then says, I hope for you that you're receiving. Now the disciples then say, Jesus, can you tell us the deeper meaning. Now, was that in the large crowd? I'm not sure. I don't think it was like the guy in the front row, you know, Peter's in the front row and says, hey, Jesus, tell us what it means. He goes, okay, I'll tell you. And he huddles around them and the rest of the crowd's like, what is he, what's he saying? But at some point, the disciples ask, what is the meaning of this? Now, is this just the 12 disciples? There's no indication. Often in the book of Luke, if you, we've seen uh, time and time again in the study that sometimes in the book of Luke, he, disciples are just in general, those who are his followers who've received the word. And so it stands the reason here that his disciples, his general, those who've accepted his teaching, he says, it's been granted to you the mysteries of the kingdom. I'm going to, I'm going to reveal the truth that's hidden in this parable. So that's what he does. Now he tells them, and we'll look at verse 11. He explains the parable, which is nice because he doesn't always explain every parable. So this is one of those that he explains it. So that's a good one for us to start with. He starts off and says, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard, and the devil comes and takes a word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy, but they have no firm root, and they believe for a while, and in temptation, they fall away. 
The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. As they go on their way, they are choked out with the worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed in good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart. They hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. So in this parable here, Jesus is mentioning, there's a, anytime you get to a parable, you want to ask, what are the key elements of this parable? And then what, how does that relate? What do we need to understand about this? So there's a few key elements. One, you have the sower or the farmer who sows the seeds. And in this parable, this is God. In fact, in a lot of these parables, it's, it's something about the, the creator God. And so this is a character of him. Of, he's out there. He's a farmer. He's sowing seeds. Now, what is, then you want to ask, well, what is the seed? Jesus actually explains it to us here, so it's good. He says the seed is the word of God. And so what does that mean that we want to understand? Does that mean that it's the Bible? Like God's out there throwing the Bible out there? Or what is this? But the word of God, again, we want to go back into ancient context. And in the first century, they would say, okay, what is the word of God? What they had is the Hebrew scriptures, which to us is the Old Testament. And so we want to ask, well, how is this? What is this that he's mentioning? Well, what Jesus is really speaking about is in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, it tells, us the, tells the story about the creator God. It tells a story about the relationship with mankind. And the story is that we're created for relationship with God, but because of sin, we have lost that, that there's a fall, what we call, it's the, as, as sin enters the world. And then the story from that point on, the word of God tells the story of God coming. He wants to redeem and restore his people, his his creation. So the word of God is actually what then we call the good news. It's a story that there's bad news, but God wants to enter in and bring good news. Now, the word of God here, we know that the author John in the book of John says the word is actually Jesus. The author of Hebrews says the word of God is, is sharper than any Uh, sword. It's living and active. He's actually referring to Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus himself says in John, uh, sorry, in Luke chapter 24, he says, all the writings of Moses and of the prophets and of the Psalms were telling the story of me. So the word of God is the message about God's redemptive work or his desire to redeem and restore his creation. In other words, what we call that is the word equals the good news of Jesus. The gospel. It's the story of the good news. And included that is the bad news that we need a Savior, that we need a God. But now the good news for us is what all, that, that is what's being sown. The message about hope that comes through God and his love for us and the redemption that comes from God and his work on the cross that will eventually happen. So when we think of this, the seed in this is the good news. Now last week, Matt taught... And, and, and I love when I, I get away, and actually it was fun. I was driving home on a road trip last week, and I was watching the service streaming while I'm driving. I didn't watch too much, but um, it, it was cool to catch the sermon and to be amening it because it was really setting us up for this week because it was, Matt was talking about and reminded us about sitting at the feet of Jesus and what the gospel's really about. And it's not about all the things we want to do, but it's receiving what God has done. And so we're reminded of the need to strip away all the layers of the Christian faith and focus on the heart of the faith, which is the liberating truth and the good news of Jesus. Now, if you were here last week, I know Matt used an analogy of 80s music, and and I was a little offended, you know, just because that's, you know, my decade of, of choice. But so... He kind of talked about the gospel is is sometimes we make it like 80s music where we try to add a lot of stuff to it and and, and we make it bigger. And and if if you recall, 80s 80s was a long time ago. I get it. Um, Actually, I asked my youngest son the other day. He said, Dad, we're doing a, um, what do you call it, a retro dance. Uh, And it's all, everything's vintage. I was like, oh, cool. I go, so what's like, what's vintage to you? He's like, the 80s. Seriously? All right, so, so I'm vintage. And um, anyway, but so 80s music, as, as Matt said, was, it, it changed in the 90s. And the 90s stripped everything away, and, and we went from it being about the show and, and, and the guitars that were like shooting sparks and fire on the stage to you had MTV Unplugged. It became very popular to just strip everything away and just have the music. So Matt's analogy was sometimes we add a lot to the gospel, like the 80s add. In fact, I remember there was a band that in the show, the drummer had his drum cage would go up and turn upside down while he was still drumming. Anyone know the band? 
Molly, you should not know that. You shouldn't. You should not know that on a Sunday morning. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I saw them in concert. So yeah, my, yeah, Molly Crew, he used to go upside down drumming. Now, I went to a tour where that was already known. Yeah, he always does that. So in the middle of the show, all of a sudden, we're like, where's the drummer? And then we looked up, and there was a track that went around the, up, uh, around the arena, like above everybody, 100 feet above, and he was up there drumming up there. It's like, that is crazy. So, and the track went around like a little train, and he was drumming. And he got like halfway through, and then it turned upside down above the arena, and he kept drumming. That's 80s. Yeah, it is sick. I know. <laughs> and that's what it was about. It was like adding, and it wasn't always about the music, though the music's awesome. It was about the show and putting a bunch of stuff to you. But Matt reminded us last week, we don't want to do that with the gospel. We don't want to add to it. And, and sometimes we add to it by saying, oh, it's, it's what Jesus has given us, but then we, as long as we serve him. And, and, and it's, it's about Jesus' forgiveness, and then you've got to earn it back. It's about Jesus, and then, and then make sure you study and pray enough, and all of these things, which are good things, but we add to the gospel the simple message that God, because of his love for us, poured out his life to give us new hope, and we could never earn it or pay it back. So we want, we're reminded to strip all that away. We don't want the gospel to be about 80s music. In fact, he showed a picture of an 80s band, and I have that back for you today. It's a little different than last year's, but, <laughs> but this, uh, <laughs> we don't want the gospel to be like that. <laughs> look at that guy on the right. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I think in junior high, I wanted to look like that, actually. <laughs> All right, we better take that down and, and get spiritual again. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so sometimes we want to, we try to make it about a bunch of stuff. But Jesus here is saying we want the true, the good news, the good news that's really sowed. That's the seed. And strip everything else away and just receive. And it's so easy for us to add to the good news, to add to the gospel. You know, there was a movie that came out. I can't believe now it's been over 20 years. But the movie Saving Private Ryan. And Saving Private Ryan is this movie about this uh, World War II movie, and it's about this army unit that was going to rescue Private Ryan, because Private Ryan's other brothers all uh, died in World War II. He had three other brothers who died, and so they said, we want to rescue him. So they send this army unit out, and their whole mission is to save him and bring him back. And a lot of stuff happens, and they had this bitterness throughout the whole thing, like, is Ryan's life really worth all of ours? I mean, what makes him so special was what they wrestled with. And towards the end of the movie, they get to the final scene. And uh, sorry for those of you who haven't seen it yet. I'm going to spoil it. But it's been 20 years, so get over it. Like, <laughs> if you haven't seen it yet, I don't feel so bad. E.T. also ends up okay, just so you know. <laughs> so at the end of Saving Private Ryan, you have the scene where, where they, they decide they are going to they're gonna protect him. But he says, no, I, I want to stay here and finish my mission. And so they said, well, we're, we're going to help you do that and hold this town, but we're going to make sure we also protect your life. And so one by one in this battle, a lot of them lose their lives until the very end when Private Ryan's still alive. And, and Tom Hanks, who's the captain, he grabs him and, he, and he's been shot and he's about to die. And he pulls Private Ryan close and he looks at him and he says, earn this. He said, earn this. The sacrifice we made for you, the lives that were just lost for you, earn this. And then he dies. And, and for so long, I thought that that was a picture of the good news. And it's kind of, but it's actually our tendency to add to it. You see, because the good news would never pull us close and say, earn this. Pay it back. Give back to Jesus because he's given his life for you. The good news would be, Private Ryan, you're free. That's it. You see, and so sometimes we think the good news is about Jesus' sacrifice for, for us, so therefore, I'm going to pay it all back. No, it's already paid. Now, the rest of the movie, which is only a scene where he's reflecting, he looks at his wife, Private Ryan, now he's um, older, and he just says, have I lived a good life? Now, again, that would be earning it back. That's not the gospel. But I do think when we dwell on the sacrifice made for us, when we focus on Jesus and what he's done, that frees us to actually love and serve others. It, and, and so we get the order right. And that is the good news. Again, a couple things we were reminded of last week. Doing does not equal being. 
And, and so it's very easy to think if we do the right things and we become Christian. No, no, no. It's what Christ has already done. So let's get that order right. The other thing about the good news is receiving precedes achieving. It's not that we achieve and then we can receive from Christ, but we just, we receive. That's what precedes what happens in our lives, is receiving from the work that God has done. That frees us to then live uh, and to live a life of freedom before him. So the seed here, the good news, is that stripped down, it is the message about Jesus, his incredible love for you and for me, and the work that he has done for you and for me, and the life that he has given to us. That's the good news. In this story, it's the word of God. Now, what's the other piece of the story? It's the soil. It's the soil. That's the other key factor here. And Jesus uses that. And what is the soil in the story? It's our hearts. The soil is our openness, and it's our hearts. Do we accept the good news? Do we accept it for a short time? Do we, ha- we receive the good news, but with a bunch of other things filled with that worry and strife and all of that? Or do we have the soil that receives the good news with a good and pure heart, and, and then we see the, the, that good news grow and bear fruit? In other words, the kingdom of God is alive in us. The rule and reign of Christ produces fruit in our lives. There's evidence of the good news being made known. And again, notice here, The work that's being done, the work has been done by the farmer. We are the soil. We're not even the seed that's growing. We're not even the fruit that's being produced. We're the hearts that receive it, and then we see the work of God take place in and around us. And so, again, we don't want to reverse the order. It's so easy to reverse the order. Now, a couple things about the different soil. The first one he mentions is those who hear the message... But for whatever reason, it's taken away. It says Satan will take it away. And, and what that is describing is the hardening of hearts. Some of you might be in here and you say, I don't know if I really believe all this stuff. I got to talk with someone recently who said uh, she was on a spiritual journey and just seeking truth. And said, I don't know if I believe the Jesus stuff yet. And I said, that's, all, that's fine. I believe God can get a hold of your heart. But there's some who hear the message and keep rejecting it, keep rejecting it. Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, it says that no one's without excuse because all mankind have the ability or have, God has revealed himself to everyone through creation, through nature. And there's something inside of mankind that has this, this desire, this knowledge of like there's got to be something more. We're created for relationship with God, so there's some longing in, in our hearts. But as it's described in Romans chapter 1, the more we exchange the truth of God for lies, the more we reject and say, I don't want to believe that. I don't want the rule and reign of God in my life. Our hearts become harder and harder and easier to reject. And that's the first person described here. The next person here described is someone who receives the message of the good news. It grows for a little while. And then it says when persecution comes or temptation comes, they kind of abandon faith. And and some of us maybe have had seasons and periods in your life where you'd say, that's me, that represents me, where it kind of sprung up and I had a season of passion and it kind of went away. Or maybe we know people who you said, man, you used to be uh, such an example to me in my life and now they they seem to not even be walking with the Lord. And that's a description of someone who maybe for whatever reason kind of wandered away. And that's why here at at Seacoast, one of our hearts is to be a home for the wandering For those who maybe have believed but have wandered away for whatever reason, we want to be a safe place to say, I want to come back to faith. And and we believe that there's many people on that journey. The next soil that was described was the soil that the gospel's received, the good news about Jesus is received, the the word of God's received. It actually is growing, but because of distractions, the riches of the world, the worries of life, and, and things like that, that there's weeds that grow up among it. And so it is, isn't able to produce as much fruit. In other words, there's not as much evidence of the, the kingdom of God in the life of those in that kind of soil because the weeds are kind of choking it out. And, and we see this, those of you who like to garden, I actually, since both my parents were farmers, I like to grow things and garden a lot. And, and it happens, right? If you have a lot of weeds in the garden, the things don't produce as much fruit. And, and that happens a lot of our lives. So he's saying, when we are, receive the good news of Jesus, the word of God, but there's all these distractions, 
things that say, God, I don't know if I can trust you with my finances. I'm not sure I can trust you with my family. I'm not sure I can get myself to the point of forgiving others because what if they they betray me? And, And so we have all these worries and concerns that fill our lives that keep us from experiencing this evidence of the kingdom of God in us. And then finally, of course, the final one that Jesus describes is the good soil. It's the good dirt where the kingdom of God is received, where it grows, and then it has a multitude of fruit that grows. And, and all that's really saying is that, man, when the kingdom of God is alive in you, it produces so much more than you could ever explain or understand. And I believe there's times you look back at your life and say, I didn't even know I made a difference there. I didn't even know God was using that. I was talking with our staff a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about this passage and said, okay, what how do we understand this? And one of the things that we kind of agreed to was that of the four different conditions of soil that were mentioned here, we all can kind of relate that there are times in our lives we maybe have a little bit of that soil. That no one said, well, I'm just the good dirt all the time. But there's times like, man, I, you know, I went through a season where the weeds, the worries just totally took over. Or seasons where the riches of the world and, and, and just grabbed my heart. And man, it's hard to get over that. There's times when, like we mentioned earlier, when maybe just for whatever reason, the less we understand the good news of Jesus, we kind of get fatigued and walk away. And so sometimes you might be here this morning saying, man, I used to be at the good soil, but I think I've stepped back one. But I want to let you know as we look at, okay, well, how does this apply? That this is not a prescription about Christian life here, this parable. It's a description. Jesus isn't saying, okay, so the point of this story is move from the rocky soil to the good soil. He's just describing this is the evidence of the different types of soil. Now, implied is the goal of our lives is the good soil, right? We want to be the good dirt. We want to receive the good news of Jesus with an open heart. We want to have those, that open conscience that says, God, we want to surrender to the rule and reign of you in our lives. But he doesn't use it as a prescription. He just describes this. So it got me to thinking, well, then what do we do? Is this a parable saying, okay, if you got rocks, here's how to get rid of the rocks. If you have weeds, let's pull the weeds. Now, some of that might be true. But I believe the more we grow in our belief in who God is and his promises, the more those weeds die, the more the rocks go away. And that's a process. And that's a journey. But so I want to give you, though, with that, a few thoughts that will help us in that journey. Because I really believe the kingdom of God is about receiving, accepting, and believing. And the good dirt that Jesus is asking us to have is just that. Learn to accept and receive and believe everything about Christ. In fact, last week it was mentioned, we've, we've mentioned this verse many times before, but often we'll say like, well, what work do we do then? How do we till the soil? What is the work we need to do? Well, they asked, some people asked Jesus, what does God require of me? What work does he require? In John chapter 6, verse 29, Jesus answers that. I have it on the screen. He says this, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who God has sent. When Jesus, someone asked Jesus, what should I do to prepare the soil? What should I do for you? He says, believe in me. That's the work that we start with. We want to start there. So the question is, how do we persist in this work? Even, you know, a couple weeks ago, my son asked me, he said, hey, dad, do you ever have so much doubt that it makes it hard to preach? And I just said, no, next question. All right, let's go. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, what a great question, right? Because as we go through life, there's times when questions come up and there's doubts. There's times when I'm studying all this, I just think, wow, what if this isn't true? What if none of this is true? And I'm preaching it. We find in Psalm chapter 73, we're going to go back to it in a minute, but it starts with the psalmist saying, as for me, my foot had almost slipped. I started looking around at the wicked, and I saw that their lives seemed to be better than mine. They didn't have any worries. They seemed prosperous. Life seemed good for them. And so Asaph, who's writing the psalm, says, I kind of started looking around and saying, God, really? Is this the life for me? So you might be there today. So what are some practical things that can help us persist in this believing in Jesus? How can we check the condition of our soil? Let me give you a couple things. This first one I'm going to give you is purely practical. It's not even biblical. 
It's just practical. Now, I believe it's based in scripture and there's truth in it. It's not heresy, but this is just my own little practical theology, okay? So the first thing here that I think helps the condition of our soil to think about, here's a practical thing, is remember the things that help you feel connected to God. Now, I know that sounds new agey, but it's not. So let me get to it. What are the seasons or the times when you say, I just sense the presence of God most when this happens? And for some of you, it's studying scripture. Some of you, when you start digging into the verses and then you find the meaning of a Greek word or the Hebrew culture, I see you, you kind of light up inside and you start saying, did you see this Greek word? I know because I'm that nerdy like that. And so, and I'll say it to people and they look at me like, great, Ryan. But there's something that happens for some of you when you start digging deep into scripture where all of a sudden your spirit is just, your soul is just receiving and being fed. For some of you, it's prayer. Some of you are amazing prayer warriors. Some of you just love to pray. You can't pray enough. If that's you, if you know, man, if I'm in a good prayer session, you have a friend who prays with you and you're like praying back and forth and with power, you get out of that and like your face is glowing. It's like bright. And I'm looking at you like an Italian painting, like, wow, you were with Jesus. Some of you, that's what prayer does for you. I would say if that's you, make sure you have that as a rhythm in your life. And again, not making it a law, but making it as, wow, it seems like God really speaks to me through this. So it's just a practical thing. If you know that's you, I I confess, I pray, I pray often, I pray about many things, I believe in it, I believe in the power of it, but I'm not a great prayer. I'm not one of those who's like, oh, let's go six hours in prayer right now. You know, that's tough for me. So, but some of you just totally light up that way. For you, it might be journaling, it might be reading a good book about God. Now, don't ever make Christian literature replace scripture, okay? Um, but if that speaks to your heart, um, a lot of times it's good friendships where you can talk about God in your relationship. If that's you, don't neglect that. Now, by the way, all these things are good things that we can all do, but some of you, you know, this is, this is me. One might be musical worship. Some of you, when you have musical worship, it just speaks to your spirit. Well, I would recommend find a way that your Spotify is set to worship, Turn off the 80s rock <laughs> and watch what, what happens. Um, another one could be just being out in nature. A couple weeks ago, we had an opportunity as a family, went on a road trip because they're always begging, Dad, can we drive somewhere 3,000 miles? It'd be fun. And um, as I know, as everyone is asleep, is asleep in the car, I'm like, hey, boys, you see America? Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> yeah. That's what my dad used to say when I was asleep. <laughs> But we went out into Wyoming where my youngest was doing a, di- a dinosaur dig, digging up dinosaur bones. And um, one of my other sons and I, we went fly fishing. And we're here in the mountains in Wyoming and in this canyon and these big mountains around us and cold mountain stream and uh, fly fishing with your son. And I think like, wow, that's a pretty, how do you not think God exists in that moment? And, and I'm not just saying just there, like I'm out in one with nature. No, it was, it was very prayerful be out there and God, I'm so grateful for this moment. So grateful that I can be out here with my son. So grateful of this beautiful creation. So grateful when I take a deep breath, air goes in my lungs and just air. It's amazing being out here. And for me, I realize getting up in the mountains is one of those times when all of a sudden prayer is easier and, and, and studying scripture. There's just something. And for some of you, New York City is what does it for you, okay? Not me. <laughs> But so, again, these are not biblical. These are just observations I've had that find what it is that you feel like God uses those moments. Now, don't make that your religion, but make sure, man, if you're going through a dry season in your life and feel like maybe God hasn't been speaking to you, what is it? When has he? And see if you can create time and margin for for those moments. Okay, track it with me on that? All right. Now, let me give you a couple more um, biblical things. (laughs) All right. Next one is this. So, so these are the important ones too. Whatever it is, make sure, here, here's the one, make it about Jesus. Make it all about Jesus. Don't make it about the trip to nature. Don't make it about your prayer. Don't make it about the studying scripture. Don't make it about service. Those are all good, but make sure it's all centered on Jesus and it's about Jesus. Good soil is receiving the good news, which is focused on who Jesus is. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I have it on the screen for you here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, sorry, chapter 11 for this one. 
he's writing and he says, I'm afraid that, uh, I'm afraid that your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And he was talking about some of you have been hurt, hearing a different gospel, a, a gospel that says it's about Jesus and then you also have to be circumcised. Or it's about Jesus as long as you also don't eat this forbidden food. It's about Jesus as long as you also make sure you're following the law. And so that was being preached. And Paul said, I'm afraid that you're going to be led astray from the simple uh, purity and simplicity of devotion to Christ. And it was a warning to say, make it about Jesus, not the other stuff. The other stuff flows from the, the heart. Again, we start with Jesus and the other things flow. So make sure to have the good soil, the good dirt in your life. Your focus keeps going back to the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. So make it about the work of God and not your work, not your prayers, your service, your sacrifice. All of those are good, but they flow from the work that Christ has done in you. So make it about Jesus. The next thing for us when we're checking the condition of our soil is this. Trust God's character and his promises. Let's grow in our trust or grow in our belief of God's character and his promises. You know the weeds that pop up, the, the shallow soil, all of those come when we fail to believe and trust who God says he is. Now, I can't make myself automatically just go like, okay, I trust everything. It's a process. But let's grow in our belief in who God is and in his promises. And as we grow in that, focus on Christ, we find the condition of our, the soil, the dirt in our lives is actually receives the good news. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll, again, have it on the screen for you. He says this, Such confidence we have through Christ towards God, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. He's the one who makes us adequate, adequate as servants. In other words, we trust that what God provides for us is enough. We trust that who we are in Christ is enough. I trust that as I lead the church, as, as God has placed me here for this season, that there are times when I think, God, am I really adequate to do this? Do I really have everything you need? And the answer is, well, you're here now, and, and I'm with you, and so would you just start to believe that I can be enough through you? You might say, well, I, I'm not adequate to, as a parent. I, I want to raise my kids as, in, in, in the ways of the Lord, but I'm not, God, I don't measure up. I'm not good enough. And G, Paul's saying, no, you're not. But your adequacy comes from Christ. So let's learn to grow in that trust that what he provides for us is enough. And that's a journey. That's a process. It takes time. But if you feel yourself ridden with shame and guilt because you feel like you keep, don't measure up, are you really believing the good news? This morning, do you need to hear Jesus say, I'm enough for you. I love you. I remove your burden." Be free. So as we end here, I'm, I'm, the, the question for us is really, what's the condition of your soil? How's your dirt in your life? What are the things that maybe have distracted you? Or maybe this morning, do you need to just go back? Stop what you're doing and say, Jesus, let me just turn my focus back on you. Let me just reverse from trying to make this about me. Let me just for a moment stop to think that I have to somehow work my way back or earn, or I'm not even going to serve you because I'm inadequate. Anyone ever say that? And God, this, and, and this morning maybe you can just say, God, I need to receive from you. And with all this, I, I also just think a practical thing. Don't diminish the work that Jesus has done or is doing in you. When we go through life saying, well, I'm nobody, or I'm just, I'm insignificant, like, you know what? You're right. You are. <laughs> we all are. But in Christ, that's not true of you anymore. That's not true of you in Christ. You're not nobody. You're not insignificant. The work that Jesus is doing you, don't diminish that. Don't diminish that the creator of the universe gave his life for you. Don't say you're not worthy. He chose to do that for you. Receive that receive that. So I'm going to invite the worship team to make their way up. And as they make their way up, uh, again, 
Today is about our posture before God, the soil in our lives. And the last thing we want to do is to make you say, man, I got to go pick some rocks, pull some weeds this week. Well, there might be rocks and weeds in your life, that, but we want, as the more we turn our hearts back to God, we want to allow him to be the gardener conditioning your soul. And if we're open and we receive, he's going to lead you. He's going to do a work in you. And we participate with him, by the way. This doesn't mean, well, I get to go home and just sit on the couch and watch the World Cup. It's already over. <laughs> but no one here cares, so that's fine. <laughs> it's not passive and just sit there, but it's active work of God in you. And so let's end our time. And, and for some of you, maybe you just need to confess today that you keep trying to do this on your own. Or that you just can't quite trust that what he has done is enough. That you can't quite trust that he actually wants to forgive you. That you can't quite trust that he is good even to you. And for some of you, maybe you just need to worship and say thank you. That you've grown so much. But let's end our time and, and just with some prayer. And I want to invite you to stand. And then we're going to sing one final song as our prayer as a community to God. So stand with me. Lord God, I thank you so much for this morning, and I thank you again that, Lord, uh, in this story, we're the soil, and the question for us is, can we be open to receiving your word? And Lord, then can we be open to see your word grow and produce fruit in our lives, evidence of your kingdom? And Lord, so I confess the many times when I get distracted and have the weeds, and the times when the shallow so soil causes me to want to walk away, or I confess the times when I add to the good news, thinking that I can somehow make it grow. And Lord, we this morning want to be a people who are transformed and changed by you. And so let this community of faith be all about you and your work. And so now receive this song as our prayer, as our anthem to you, Lord, as we give it to you. In your name, amen.